Hello, I'm Laura Howard, Community Schools Coordinator for Batesville School District. I want to welcome everyone to the first Pioneer Parent Academy session titled Batesville School District Special Programs. During this session, you'll be hearing from several guests. First, you'll hear from Ms. Christy Cox, Special Programs Director, Ms. Amber Barker, Speech Therapist, Mr. Lance Hall, Occupational Therapist, and Ms. Emily Hoskins, Physical Therapist. Our guests will be sharing information related to special education services and multiple related services available to support our students' learning. I'll now hand it off to Ms. Christy Cox, our Special Programs Director. Welcome, Ms. Christy. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to briefly touch today on um, special education, the process of referral. Um, I'll visit just very briefly about the related services, but I'm going to let Emily and Lance and Amber um, do the talking for their portion because they are our experts. So um, if briefly, let's look at the components that we'll be discussing today. That will be the referral process, what is involved with the evaluation process, how we determine if a student qualifies for services and is placed, how we develop the IEP, um, subsequent conferences that happen throughout um, a child's school career through reevaluation, and then I'll just briefly touch on a component of related services before I pass that off. So, for the referral for special education, those can come from a variety of sources. Um, our parents, our teachers, local physicians, um, our response to intervention teams at our local buildings um, are, are all sources that we um, receive referrals from. When the team actually gets together to meet, the IEP team um, will include the parent or the guardian, um, the child's teacher, um, the special education teacher or the speech language pathologist and then any other therapist if the student is having an issue with fine motor or gross motor needs those professionals will be included as well in addition um, just a tidbit of information districts must schedule the referral conference in writing and that invitation must be mailed to the parent so and that has to be mailed 14 days in advance and then once one of our families or our parents or guardians receive that referral in the mail, if that date and time does not work for them, there will be a signature and phone number at the bottom of that invitation so that the parent can call and reschedule. Our parents know our students better than anybody else and so they're a vital part of the team. Um, we're going to discuss things like the student's performance in class. We're going to look at that student's statewide standardized testing scores either on NWEA MAP or um, through ACT Aspire. We'll also look at their interim assessment scores. We're going to make sure that that student um, passes their hearing and vision screening. We're going to look at attendance, if there's any medical diagnoses, if the student has had previous services at some time in their preschool or school age career. We're gonna look at developmental concerns, um, prenatal history, developmental milestones that should have been met through the child's toddler years, and then anything else that's going to be relevant to that child's educational need, we're going to talk about at that referral conference. At the referral conference, the team has to decide, are we going to make a recommendation for this student to have an evaluation? And that is a team decision um, that everybody comes to a consensus to. Um, for the evaluation to take place, the parent or guardian must give written permission before that evaluation can be completed. Um, we do have some timelines that we have to look at. Once we get consent from the parent, we have 60 days to complete our evaluation. Once the evaluation is complete, we have 30 days after that to meet again, look at the results of the evaluation, and then determine if the student meets one of the qualifications um, under one of our 12 categories in order to provide services um, to those students. If you'll notice on the PowerPoint, um, I do have the 12 categories listed for school-aged children in the state of Arkansas. Um, each one of those is a link directly to the Arkansas Department of um, Special Education website so that you can um, take the time to click on those links and see the specific criteria and the testing components that are required for each of those categories. So once we determine if the child meets um, that criteria, um, 
the presence of the disability must also then cause an educational deficit. Um, and I use my own children sometimes as an example. Um, one of my children has hypoglycemia. And because that medical diagnosis does exist, then to determine if um, he needed an IEP, we would have had to have looked at all the testing components and then determined if that hypoglycemia cost him an educational deficit. And it did not. So the presence of a disability does not always necessarily mean that the student is going to have placement in special education if there's not an educational deficit. So when the team um, gets back together to go over the testing results, if the district is going to recommend placement for that student, um, a lot of times the special education teachers or the speech pathologists are going to have a draft IEP just kind of already generated with some basics, um, basic information, um, and then that IEP is kind of honed through that meeting process. So what is exactly on an IEP? So there has to be current educational data. So that's going to also include the student's strengths and their needs. We want parent input. We need to discuss things like, does the student need assistive technology or braille or educational interpreting or a behavior plan? Um, we're going to develop annual goals. We're going to assign classroom accommodations if the student needs those. We're going to assign testing accommodations if the student needs those. We're going to look at their schedule throughout the day, how much time they might need resource English or resource math. We're going to look at related services, which would be occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, um, personal care. We have some students who receive personal care services within the school. And then at the very end, we're going to determine, um, we will typically call it the LRE. LRE stands for Least Restrictive Environment. And that is how much time the student spends with their peers outside of special education. And we always want that to be the maximum extent possible that our students are with their um, peers in that regular education setting. Um, throughout a student's career, they will have a reevaluation process. Reevaluation conferences must occur every three years or more often as needed. New testing does not have to be completed every three years, but the IEP team is required to sit and discuss. Do we need more testing data? And once again, we're going to look at that same educational data, ACT Aspire, map testing, um, if the students, what interventions they've had, if any additional RTI, grades, we're gonna update their social history. So there's a number of things that we can look at to determine if the student has made progress without actually having to do that full comprehensive evaluation again. Some other conferences that we have, um, during a child's lifetime, we might have a transfer conference. That happens when a student comes from another district and already has an IEP in place. We might do a separate programming conference to update the child's IEP. If we need to discuss any behavior issues or medical issues that have come up um, during the child's tenure at school, um, we would need to sit down and discuss those things. We do occasionally have conferences for dismissals um, when a student um, has worked through the process in their little lives and we determine that you know they, they no longer have an educational deficit, um, they may be dismissed um, from special education. We also have two very important conferences. One is in early childhood, so that will happen at the beginning of a, a kindergarten or school age career. We start that process in March of every school year. Then we like to look at post-secondary transition and that occurs with a student um, on or before the age of 16 and that just helps us prepare for what that student's going to do when um, they graduate from Batesville High School. Very briefly, um, related services. Um, today we're going to touch on occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech therapy. And I'm going to give, um, before I hand it off, just give a little bit of a brief overview. One of the questions that we receive frequently through our department is, why did my child receive speech therapy five days a week at a private outpatient clinic, but we might only be recommending 60 minutes of speech therapy at school? And so we, we need to look at the differences in what we call the educational model and the medical model of services. Um, for speech therapy, occupational therapy, or physical therapy that's going to um, happen at school, we typically will take those referrals from parents, from teachers, or maybe even the IEP team. For a student that has a medical necessity, that's almost always going to come from their primary care physician. 
for eligibility for services, that is typically tied to the adverse effect on the educational performance. Whereas in the medical model, eligibility is going to be based on clinical assessment and observation. Um, for educational model, services are delivered through the IEP, which is the Individualized Education Program, and we're going to do those services at school. Whereas in a medical model, the services are provided in an outpatient therapy setting under what um, they would call a plan of care or a treatment plan. For the educational model of services, this is at no cost to the parent. If the student um, qualifies for those services, and they need services to access what they're doing in special education, we're going to provide those services. Um, in the medical model, the ultimate responsibility of cost is actually going to be through the parent, maybe through co-pays, um, and then also Medicaid and private insurance um, will kick in um, with the out-of-pocket costs coming from the parent. Um, through the school district, um, for the educational model, um, when the parents give us permission to, we will bill Medicaid um, or we will be bill private insurance, but ultimately, if the student qualifies for the service, then we are going to provide that through the individualized education plan. So that's just my brief overview of special education and related services. So I'm going to hand back off to Ms. Laura Howard to introduce our next speaker. Hi, I'm Amber Barker and I'm one of the four speech pathologists in the Batesville School District. Um, after a speech pathologist receives a referral, we will go through the evaluation um, and typically that evaluation will consist of looking at their speech sound production, um, language, and um, from that point we will typically determine if the student meets eligibility. Um, once a student meets eligibility for speech language um, therapy services in the school, the speech pathologist will work collaboratively with the IEP team um, that Ms. Cox mentioned earlier um, and collaboratively create goals that meets the student's needs. Um, a student's needs in the school um, in regards to speech and language therapy could involve several different factors um, that we have listed here on the screen. Um, that could be speech sound errors, what we typically call articulation delays. Um, we also will target expressive and receptive language. Um, expressive language is what a student is able to verbally express um, and receptive is how they understand and process language internally. Um, that could look like answering questions in a classroom or labeling or um, defining vocabulary in the classroom. Um, we also work on social communication. Um, so those are identifying social cues in the classroom, how they're able to communicate with peers, um, appropriateness of language use. Um, we also work on several different um, aspects of cognition. That could look like working memory, um, using information in the classroom in real time, processing and being able to express. And we also work on fluency and stuttering, voice, so any hoarseness, raspness, and then also augmentative and alternative communication. And those are typically for our students who are nonverbal or who have some severe speech sound delays. I and mean, it allows them to have a different mode of communication, whether that is high tech, such as a talker, or low tech, which could be a picture exchange system. So for the effect on their educational performance, we typically will provide services either direct, and that's where we pull them into the therapy room in either an individual session or a group session. Um, it could be in direct services where we do check-ins or on consult basis. Our job as a speech pathologist in the school is to allow students to express their thoughts and ideas, articulate more clearly, and allow them to effectively communicate in the school setting. Thank you for that wonderful information. Um, next up, we have Mr. Lance Hall, Occupational Therapist for our district. Good morning, how are y'all? Um, so yes, I'm the Occupational Therapist within the Batesville School District. I work alongside the uh, rest of the IEP team, the other therapists and, and staff. We do have another occupational therapist within school and a certified occupational therapy assistant. And so what our job is basically is uh, to find out what the kids need to do, what they have to do and what they want to do. And like Miss Christie said earlier, our focus is on academics within the school environment. It may also involve things like uh, simple things like dressing, writing, preferential seating within the classroom. It may involve some, some sensory processing that kids have difficulty with. 
So that's the thing that we look at within the school setting. We do uh, standardized assessments to look at their deficiencies, look at visual motor and fine motor to see, make sure they can um, just see what tools they have within the writing process. The way they hold their pencil, the way they stabilize while they're writing, posture while they're writing. If writing is not a means of doing their work, then we look at keyboarding. We look at several ways that kids are able to express their work through academics. And then we also look at other things they may be struggling with as well. One thing that um, we get a lot of referrals for is, is censoring. And just the kids, we want to make sure they're not struggling uh, within the classroom or find out what issues they're actually having for them to be to perform well. Uh, we look at auditory, visual stimuli, olfactory stimuli, and then other things like proprioceptive and vestibular input of how they move in space and, and how they, uh, their motor control and everything of, of what they, that feedback that they get. So we look at all those things within Century and try to accommodate within the classroom with accommodations, uh, m modifications, whether it be types of seating or where they sit in the classroom and things like that. So with that, we just basically, uh, after the meeting, the IEP meeting, we set up a frequency of time and we have to work around not only their academics within the classroom, but we have to work around their special schedules, their music, their uh, art, their PE, all those classes and, and recess and lunch. So that's why it's so important to have that least restricted environment where they can participate in that classroom with their peers. And so sometimes we, we do pull those kids out during that time that we see them, but sometimes we also do push in if it's not a distraction to the individual student or, or the whole class. And we collaborate with teachers as well uh, during the referral process and the and the whole treatment, just to just to gain information uh, besides their previous history. We may see how they're doing within the classroom. Is morning better is afternoon better. Their focus or attention or the behavior and and that sort of thing. So we tend to look at the whole take a holistic approach and look at uh, look at the student physical body and the mind and the environment uh, when we're treating the child. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Such good information. Up next, we have Miss Emily Hoskins, who is our physical therapist for the district. Uh, thank you for joining us, Miss Emily. Thank you for having me. We also have Jenny Lander. She's a physical therapist assistant that helps me with the treatment in the district. As far as physical therapy in the school, it's like OT and speech, it's a related service that or a supportive service that can be used to help a child with a disability benefit from special education. So if the student's educational team decides that a referral is needed for physical therapy and the parent gives consent, we will perform an evaluation. And usually we're looking at their gross motor abilities. So in that we think of strength, range of motion, coordination, muscle tone, posture, balance, endurance, and their functional mobility in the in the environment and in their daily activities. We're going to use standardized tests that are age appropriate. Observation and measurements. We're going to talk to the the staff, the teachers, the people that interact with the student on a daily basis. Talk to the parent and figure out what their concerns are and what needs the student has. And then we're going to work with the IEP team to establish goals that are pertinent to that child's education. If it determines that physical therapy is needed for them to participate in their educational environment. We're going to coordinate our services with the team members and collaborate and then and document our services. We try to work in the child's least restrictive environment as well and that may be in the classroom, maybe in PE or on the playground or going to the bus in the hallways, which we try to help the child access their environment where they're having the difficulties. But we do sometimes need to pull them into our PT room to target certain things to work on, work on their goals. Mm -hmm. We also will assist with obtaining equipment or assistive technology, whether it's orthotics or braces or wheelchairs, walkers, standers, etc., and help with training the staff on how to use that equipment and monitor for adjustments to the equipment that are needed or calling in people, specialists that can help us order that equipment. Then we're going to monitor their process, their progress with annual reviews and evaluations as needed. But the main goal for physical therapy in the school is to 
help the child access their academic curriculum and participate in other school activities, improve their access to the school environment. Great information. Thank you so much, Emily. All right, Ms. Christie, we'll be back to you with 504 comparison to IDEA. One of the hats that I wear, in addition to being the special education supervisor, is um, I am also the district 504 coordinator. So section 504 operates just a little bit differently with regard to their definition and who uh, might qualify for a 504 plan. Um, children not eligible for special education services may actually qualify for some accommodations through a 504 plan. Just a little comparison between IDEA or special education um, and 504. IDEA stands for Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Students ages 3 to 21 who have very specific the criteria that I posted earlier in the PowerPoint. Um, students ages 3 through 21 who meet those criteria um, might qualify for special education. Whereas with 504, the student, the definition would be have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. The categories for special education are very well defined by law, whereas 504 is really just that broad definition. The student has to have a concern that impacts um, their daily life. Special education will provide individual supplemental educational services that help um, the student and support them in the general education classroom, whereas 504 requires that schools eliminate barriers that would prevent a student from participating in the programs that they offer. So that's why you see ramps coming into our buildings, why we have handicap accessible parking spaces so that we allow for constituents and students to be able to even enter our buildings. This also for IDEA, there is a requirement through um, federal law that requires that the IEP be reasonably calculated to provide educational benefit to the student. Whereas with 504, that requires a service plan with accommodations that allow students access to the general education curriculum. One thing that I do like to point out is that um, any teacher can accommodate at any point in time in their classroom, whether the student has a special education plan or a 504 plan, teachers can always provide accommodations um, to our students and the plan does not have to be in place for accommodations to occur in a particular classroom setting. However, if the plan is in place, then that becomes a requirement um, that the teacher must do rather than them doing it on their own. So if there's a signed plan, then that becomes part of that student's educational record and it's their right to be able to have those plans. Thank you so much for our guests today. And this concludes our first Pioneer Parent Academy session titled Batesville School District Special Programs. And again, if you'd like to request additional information, please contact Ms. Christy Cox and you'll see our contact information here on the here. final slide of the presentation.